Good evening, one and all. Welcome to this evening's live stream presentation here on the Tattooed Historian's Facebook and YouTube channel. My name is John. I am the Tattooed Historian, and I am so thrilled to have a fellow Mead defender on tonight <laughs> with me. It's, finally, we're, we're having this happen. Uh, Kent Masterson Brown is joining us this evening. Uh, uh, Kent is a, an award-winning writer, filmmaker, uh, attorney living in Lexington, Kentucky. Uh, his previous book, which is also a fantastic work brought out by UNC Press, is uh, Retreat from Gettysburg, involving Lee Logistics and the Pennsylvania Campaign. I'll be putting a link up in the chat for his newest work, which I have right here, Mead at Gettysburg, a study in command. And I will also have a 40% off code for all of you to take advantage of. So you can buy both books tonight. I'm sure Kent would appreciate that. I would. Kent, <laughs> thank, you, thank you so much for being here, my friend. My pleasure. It's great to be here, John. Oh, it's awesome to have you on. This is a, it's been a while coming for me because as soon as I received the book and I read it, I wrote your name down as like, I need to contact Kent to come on and, and oh. discuss me in general on top of some other uh, things that, that we'll go over, but there's no gotcha questions. So, so don't worry about that. Yeah, uh, worry about but, but Kent, you've, you've had a long career uh, helping historians along the way, generations of historians. I know that one of my pals, uh, Pete Carmichael, saw you at a young age. Uh, so I'm not trying to, to date you here, Kent, with that, but it's great to have you on to influence yet another generation of, of oh, historians. He was 15 years old when he uh, heard me speak in Indiana. Yeah. Such and a we young, got to be buddies. Yeah. Such, yeah, a, yeah. such a young kid back then. Yeah. <laughs> Not knowing what it was like to be a historian. <laughs> yeah. And I remember one of the, what Gary Gallagher. Uh -huh. um, at, at one time early in my, uh, uh, even my law career, but I, was, I became the editor of a magazine uh, called Virginia Country uh, Civil War. It was mm -hmm. an old Virginia Country magazine published out of Berryville in Middleburg, Virginia. Oh, okay. And, um, uh, I decided editing that, that uh, I'd hold uh, some Civil War seminars. And the first one I ever held was held at the Wayside Inn in uh, Middletown, Virginia, which okay. is still operating. It's a wonderful place. Yeah. I was there just a week ago. <laughs> and um, uh, I held it there. And um, I invited this, this young guy from uh, Texas to join us. He had just published a book on Dodson Ramser. Mm -hmm. And um, since the uh, the uh, height house there was the place where Ramser died, I thought, why not have this guy named Gary Gallagher? And he published his, his dissertation as his first book uh -huh. on Dodson Ramser. And so he came here, came up there. I We, we got to be friends. He gave his talk. I think it was the first talk he ever gave outside of a school. Wow. And, um, uh, that, you know, that's how far back we go, you know, wow. in, um, in this stuff. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's amazing. Uh, he and I are still close friends. And um, we, uh, he's actually coming out here to Kentucky in May to speak to the Kentucky Civil War Roundtable. So oh, it's fantastic. be good to see him again. Hadn't yes. seen him in a while. Yes, he's he is going to be on this channel in December for a is second he? time. Yeah, okay. yeah. Well, tell him I said I, hello. I guess he enjoyed himself the first time. He's, <laughs> yeah. not, he's, yeah. he's, not, he's not scared to come hang out with yeah. me here. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, but I will, I will send his regard, uh, your regards to him. Please do, please do. Come on here, uh, but that's that's great. And and you've influenced so many, and you've you've given people like Gary uh, a chance to to talk and and showcase their talents. Where did your uh, start in history begin? Where was that kind of fire fueled or the spark for well, of course, to do that? Yeah, I, 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 a, a fun question for me. Um, uh, of course, I was born and raised in Kentucky. Uh, my mother and father both came from up east. My father from Brooklyn, New York, by way of Montclair, New Jersey, and my mother from Newark, New Jersey, by way of of uh, Maplewood, New Jersey. But uh, my mother had a sister uh, whose 
husband and family moved from New Jersey to Martinsburg, West Virginia. Mm -hmm. And they in turn brought my mother's mother and his and her brother to also to a site in Martinsburg near them. And oh, I would say two times a year, uh, we would get on the train, uh, the Chesapeake and Ohio here in Lexington and take it to Washington, get there in the morning and then take the Baltimore and Ohio out from Washington along the Potomac Mm -hmm. uh, cross into West Virginia at Harper's Ferry and then go on to Martinsburg, which was the next stop after Harper's Ferry. Mm -hmm. And I'm telling you, um, I remember stopping at Harper's Ferry and the, the conductor asking me, uh, young fella, do you, have you ever heard of John Brown? The first thing I thought of was, is he related to me or something like this? <laughs> I had no idea. <laughs> but, uh, but I said, uh, no, and he began to try to explain to me John Brown's raid at Harper's Ferry. Right. Well, that, and he says, that was one of the causes of the Civil War, he said. Well, the train moved on toward Martinsburg, and I got out, and my aunt met us there. And after we put our duds away, she asked me, would you like to go see the Antietam battlefield, which is only 10 miles from Martinsburg? Mm -hmm. So I kind of went, yeah. <laughs> and I went, followed her over there. And here now is, and I say, what is, what's with the anti? She says, it's a civil war battle. So here's twice in one morning, I get this civil war thing. Right. And we go out to the Antietam battlefield. And folks, the Antietam battlefield in 1950, what was it, four, five, mm -hmm. was a vastly different looking place than you see today. Right. Um, it, it, it was in the rough. And uh, but still you had the monuments, you still you had the guns out there and so forth. And we drove along this the, the battlefield road around the cornfield and the Mummersburg Road and all this. And um, uh, I just became enamored with this. And I went back home after that visit. And every time now we would visit every other next time and the next time. Uh, I would ask if we could go again. And yeah. then my father came up, this is 1956, and joined us and um, took me to Gettysburg. And I'm telling you, by then, it was a terminal disease. <laughs> <laughs> right. I, I was done. I was cooked. Yeah. Yeah. And um, uh, that began a lifelong interest in it. Just yeah. Lifelong. That's, that's amazing. And, and, I have seen photos of Antietam in the mid 20th century and it's it's a different world. Oh, it was a different than world. it is now. It's it's amazing how much it's changed. Can I tell you a funny funny tale sure. in your mind? Um there there is a, there was a little uh shop located at the head of the bloody lane of the sunken road at Antietam. Mm -hmm. Uh known as Lorman's uh snack shop or whatever and and they sold cokes and you know candy and stuff right and i my brother and i were wandering around the battlefield this is in the again the early or mid 1950s and um uh this is on another trip up there and um we went up to this place and wanted a coke and so he brought out some Cokes. And um, I looked on the counter where the, he put the Cokes, and it was a glass counter. And underneath the glass were relics. Mm -hmm. There was buckles and bullets and all kinds of stuff that had been plowed up there. Mm -hmm. And then there was this femur bone with a bullet <laughs> stuck in the joint. And, and I looked at that, and I said, is that for sale? <laughs> And he goes, well, it is, young fella, it is. And I said, what do you want for it? He says, well, now, you know, uh, I'm probably going to have to ask something like $20 for something like that. <laughs> but he says, you know, and by the way, that was like $2 million to me. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> and, uh, I, and he says, but you know, young fella, I've actually promised this to a fellow over in Boonesboro. So I really don't think I have the right to sell it because I kind of promised it to him. And I said, are you sure you couldn't hold it for me or something <laughs> like this? And he says, no, I don't think I could do that. 
Well, it was years and years and years later. I was get, leading a tour of Antietam, and uh, we were we were out there chatting. And I happened to bring that story up, and someone came to me and he says, "Can't that bone? It's in the museum in Boonesboro." Oh, he says, wow. I saw it just the other day. <laughs> I said, you've got to be kidding me. So oh, the guy in Boonesboro did, in fact, buy the bone. I mean, it was yeah, <laughs> I was wondering if it was that guy, actually, because I know the museum there. What's the, what's the name of that museum? I, I can't remember. It, but, it's, but it's right there on the main. Right on the main. Right. Yeah, right. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Well, they own the bone. They have the bone. <laughs> <laughs> wow. <laughs> There it is. Paul, Paul is in the chat there. The Bass Museum. In Bass Boonesboro. Museum. Thank there you, you go. All right. Thank there you go. Me. There you go. <laughs> there we go. Get yeah. a little help from the crowd already. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. But Antietam yeah, was my exactly. battlefield of first impression. I, I wow. have always yeah. gone back to Antietam. I, yeah. I love the battlefield. I love the story. And, uh, yeah. I think there was a, a great uh, there's a great story that you had spoken of earlier throughout the years, and you brought it up in the in the book. Uh, which leads into your your previous book on the retreat, which mm -hmm. I thought was fascinating, was that I think it was your father was in the 36th Infantry Division? 36th Division, yes. Yeah, 30, and and uh, he fought in Sicily and Italy and such. And he actually brought up the idea of uh, pursuit through through mountains and yes, stuff. He did. You were just a kid. Yeah, um, we, we were, my father was a... Um, he commanded two companies, companies A and B of the 636 Tank Destroyer Battalion that was attached to the 36th Division. And they were in North Africa, then Sicily, and then Salerno, the beachhead at Salerno in Southern Italy. And then they, they, they pursued the Germans north up Highway 6 to the casino, uh -huh. uh, Rapido River, where they, the 36th Division got mauled there, uh, the Garigliano River, and then to the relief of the Allies trapped at, or at Anzio. And then they moved north and entered Rome. And once they took Rome, they went north. And my father was ultimately wounded in the invasion of southern France. Uh -huh. But he, he never talked about himself. He never liked to bring up things about himself at all. But he, he loved the army and um, he raised us like we were on a military base, to be very honest, you know, give a full report of the day at the end of the day on the summer months. He didn't want you sitting around with nothing to do. So he'd ask you, what are you supposed to do? What did you do today? And he'd stand up and give him a report. Uh, but I, I remember we were going to the seashore um, in South Carolina. Uh, I was about 14 years old and I was sitting in the front seat with him and uh, we were going through the western mountains of North Carolina. And um, there are these roads that slink their way up to the summit of the hills. And then, and he'd go, he turned to me and he says, hey, Doc, he called me Doc. He says, Doc, um, how would you like to pursue a retreating enemy up there? Hmm. And I go, I don't know, Dad. I mean, uh, I don't think I would. He says, why wouldn't you? And I'd tell him, well, I mean, enemy is always higher than you are. Uh, you're going to, they're going to be obviously firing at you. You're, you're always in a poor position, aren't you? And he goes, just ask him, just ask him what your thoughts were. Uh -huh. Of course, he was thinking about Italy, which right. is exactly what they did. Right. And it was the reason that, you know, the 36th Division suffered more casualties than any division in Europe during the war. And um, uh, it was precisely because of things like that. And it's not as though Mark Clark could have avoided it. It's just that's what he was handed. Uh -huh. And uh -huh. um, um, but, yeah, I mean, he would he would often ask me that. And then he would often talk about attacking an enemy that's in an advantageous position uh, along uh, flat fields, um, almost pre, almost guessing what I was looking at as I was drafting the part of the Mead book about he attacking Lee at fall uh, at uh, Hagerstown in the falling war, the Downsville line. Right. Um, 
and he would say, you know, this is where, you know, the division I was in got so badly mangled, was trying to attack Germans across the Rapido River and then along a flat plain that was mined and against an enemy that was along a high ridge that had a commanding position of you. Uh -huh. And he says, we lost a tremendous number of people. Uh -huh. And to the point where they even got Congress involved trying to get to Mark Clark, you know, right. um, removed from command. And, and, and uh, it, they were so bitter about it. Uh -huh. And um, so you, you, you hear that from a soldier who saw that. And you go, um, you know, does, was George Meade incorrect in not hmm. attacking Lee's position along the Downsville line? <laughs> no, he was not. He was absolutely correct. Right. And um, um, so things like that do have an impact. Mm -hmm. My father had a real impact on me. I mean, he did. Mm -hmm. I respected him immensely. And um, for his modesty, mostly, but also for his 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 uh, idea of kind of giving you lessons, not about him, but about war. And um, maybe he was sensing the fact that by then I was kind of hooked on some of this, <laughs> which right. I was. <laughs> right. And maybe, maybe also it was the, the fact that he's trying to reel in a young man from thinking that it's easy. Yes, right. Uh, and being like, it's, it's, it's a tough slog. That's and right. It's That's right. It's it's, it's a very uh, it's an ugly slog. It right. is right. Right. Yeah. And and I thought about that a lot when I read the book on on the retreat and also in 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 your latest book on Mead uh, from the logistical standpoint of how mm. much of a slog this is. But speaking of someone who gets a bad hand from the start, yeah. George Mead is is coming into command at the army at a very bad time to be military. Our commander of the Army of the Potomac, right? Yeah. He's, oh, he's not getting a good hand. Yeah. Well, when you think about it, this poor army hadn't won a thing. Someone mm -hmm. wrote to me and said, oh, but they won at Malvern Hill. Yeah, but, I mean, that, okay, won at Malvern Hill. But the entire campaign in the peninsula was lost. Mm -hmm. And the War Department told George McClellan to come on back home. Right. You've, you've, you've failed there. Um, I mean, every campaign from the big 26 months of war and they had not won a single engagement with the enemy um, or a single campaign with the enemy. And um, uh, here now, George Meade comes into command after, you know, the disaster of George Hooker. And um, uh, he is no sooner named commander and accepts, of course, is he, it was not for him to accept it. He was ordered to be the commander of the army, yeah. uh, which had never been done. And uh, because everyone else would have declined. And so instead of having him decline, they said, uh, you're going to be ordered to be commander of the Army of the Potomac. And um, he becomes commander of the Army of the Potomac. And immediately the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad is struck by Jeb Stuart's three brigades. Uh, bridges are destroyed. All the telegraph wires are taken down. And now he can't communicate with the government. And he can't get any of the supplies he has ordered for that army into Frederick. Wow. That's his first hours of command. And it gets worse as it goes on with him. And um, uh, so here, and, and, and get this, I tracked in the book <clears throat> Meade's requisitions from Montgomery Miggs, the quartermaster general. From the time he took command, June 28, until July 1, he had ordered for that army 51,000 pair of shoes. Now, the army has about 90,000 troops. 51,000 is one half of the army is shoeless. Uh -huh. Or in such bad need of shoes, they may just as well be shoeless. Right. Uh, so that gives you just a glimpse of the logistical problem Meade's facing, of getting the army supplied and then getting the army and its horses and mules fed. They hadn't been fed. And so he moves the army north, uh, cites the uh, Pipe Creek line, decides that that is a 
a tremendous defensible position, which it is, by the way. If you walk along, we were talking about walking along a battlefield, right. walk along the Pipe Creek line, you can see just how defensible it is. And it would extend from Manchester on the right flank all the way to Middle, Middle, Middleburg on the left, um, nearly 20 miles uh, of defense line. And the southern bank that he would occupy is uh, anywhere from 100 feet above the surface of the water to 50, 25 feet above the surface of the water. But anywhere you look, it's it is totally defensible. And then he determines if he's going to uh, force the enemy to fight him here, he wants his supply base seven miles in his rear at Westminster. And it has a railroad track, one single track, all the way to Baltimore. And he sets Westminster up as its supply base. And he is he winds up with Herman Haupt in command of the supply base. He winds up getting trains, five trains, one behind the other, in convoys going from Baltimore to Westminster and then back of unloading supplies during the course of this campaign. And they unload something like 2,000 tons of supplies a day at Westminster. But they cannot get those supplies to Gettysburg throughout the entire Battle of Gettysburg because of the Confederate forces threatening Culp's and Cemetery Hills. It's the Baltimore Pike from Gettysburg to Westminster that he has to use, and it's under enemy attack. Uh -huh. So he can't get anything there. Uh -huh. There was a some someone I've noticed on some some conversation on social media about an order or a, a, a state a, 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 a message that Meade penciled to Henry Halleck on uh, the uh, um, evening of July 2nd, saying, I plan to stay right here. And it's dated uh, July 2nd at eight o'clock in the evening. Yet uh -huh. it's never sent, according to George Meade Jr., young Captain George Meade, until 11 o'clock after the conference of war at Council uh -huh. of War at the Leicester House. And someone says, well, why that? Well, he couldn't get it down the Baltimore Pike at 8 o'clock. Right. They're under attack. There's, yeah. So the entire system is sh shut down. The message system, and they have a like a Pony Express system where every seven miles they have a fresh horse and a, and a new rider. And they keep relaying this all the way down the, the, the road until they get it to the place where they want it, where they can telegraph it. And that would be Baltimore. There are no telegraphs at Westminster. Uh -huh. um, and so it's like a 12-hour a journey before they can even telegraph something. And But there's no way you can get it down the Baltimore Pike. So sure, true, it's not delivered, not, not sent out until 11 o'clock at night. Mm. Yeah, it's it's almost like Meat is well. He is. He's completely cut off from DC. He's not getting totally. anything out of there, and no. he's on his own a few days into command. Right, and right. That he's right. got a. And, that, and, go you ahead. know, you know, John. Too when you when you think of supplies, you go, well, you know, these guys can last a couple of more days without some more <laughs> grub, you know, so to speak. Yeah. Maybe they can. Maybe the men can. They get weak. A man gets weak if he's not fed. Uh -huh. But think of the horses and mules. Uh, I put in the book, uh, I'm com I come from Kentucky. This is horse country. Uh, you've got to feed a horse uh, a lot in order to keep him going. Army regulations in 1861 said that a horse must be fed 14 pounds of oats and 14 pounds of hay a day to keep them alive and active in the field, make them worth something. Uh -huh. Now, if you can't feed them anything, and here you go from July 1, nothing, July 2nd, nothing, July 3rd, nothing, not until July 4th are these horses being given anything. And then it was meager what they ever could, they could get come up the Baltimore Pike. Those horses uh, become weak, they become lame, and they break down. And so when I was in the quartermaster general's records in the National Archives, here's a report by the assistant quartermaster general writing that 
he counted up the losses of horses in the Army of the Potomac during the Gettysburg campaign. 1,900 horses were killed on the battlefield. But the total loss of horses in that campaign were 14,000. That means all the rest of them are casualties of lack of food and fodder. Wow. And shoes. Yeah. You got to get iron up there. You got to, you got to, you got to get a blacksmith to hammer the shoes. Uh, And there's no, you can't get it up there. Right. So, and then they wonder how an army can't move. We don't yeah, have, right. how are you going to pull stuff when right, 14,000 right. horses are down? Uh, that that has been one thing, Kent, that I think a lot of the, the Pipe Creek line, uh, mm-hmm. that has been one thing that's held up some historians, I think, where they, they get caught in their own trap of the Pipe Creek line, where they think that uh, that's Meade's like, uh, his only thought is mm-hmm. is that he's not thinking about anything else and and uh we actually have a, a question in the in the comments that gets us to the point that i'm trying to make does can't believe lee would have actually attacked the pipe creek line um that's a great question tom and I, mm-hmm. i'm not i'm not for what ifs but it's a great question because uh because of what he did with reynolds as something that i wanted to go into also mm-hmm. and leads to the pipe creek line thing kent uh do you think that if do you think that Lee would have, you know, tried to break the Pipe Creek line? Or do you think that he might have had a different recourse? Because his object is to get to Baltimore, D.C. in the long run. Um, Lee, by the way, is a, is a commander I admire probably as much as anyone ever. Mm-hmm. Um, and um, um, I think he was one of the most talented people this country has ever produced. Hmm. Um, And uh, whether he would have attacked the Pipe Creek line or attacked Meade's core as they withdrew toward the Pipe Creek line, Hmm. I have no way of knowing. I don't. And I don't know if it would necessarily have been up to Lee then, or would it have been up to core commanders to make their own decisions about some of that. Uh, But the point remains that uh, Meade uh, f- sent forward John Reynolds to-, to Gettysburg. That was the wording of the order, to Gettysburg. He sent uh, George Sykes to Hanover. He sent uh, John Sedgwick to um, uh, Manchester. Um, and he sent uh, Slocum to two taverns, all ahead of the Pipe Creek line, mm-hmm. all designed to do one thing and one thing only. And that was to force the enemy to collect in front of them. And if the enemy then attacked to withdraw to the Pipe Creek line, that's exactly what the Pipe Creek circular says. It is exactly what Lee's letter to John Reynolds on June 30 says. And I found that letter in in the National Archives. It's all in Meade's handwriting. He, He wrote it himself. And, and, you know, and signed it, dear, it's, it, it was dear John. And it was like, please do this. And then at, at the end, it says, truly yours, George G. Meade. It's an unbelievable letter, but it illustrates the closeness those two men had. Uh-huh. So he sent them all forward for the purpose of forcing the enemy, wherever they were along the Chambersburg Pike, Chambersburg to York Pike, to collect in front of them. And then once they collected and began to threaten those troops up there, they were to fall back. Uh And the purpose was to cause the enemy to follow them. Even if the enemy followed only halfway, all that information would be important to George Meade. Uh He could then decide what he did with each of those elements of the enemy that are pursuing them. It could mean the battle would be fought north of of the Pipe Creek line. It could mean a whole lot of things. But what Meade was after was information. And, to, and, and, and he wanted that information to include an enemy that was being caused to collect, to show to those advanced corps its intentions. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. And that's straight out of Dennis Hart Mahan. It is straight out of Carl von Clausewitz. And it is straight out of Antoine de Jomini. It's totally them. Right. This is what Meade was drilled on. Mm-hmm. And it's the way, and by the way, 
I have heard people say, well, you know, these officers, they didn't, you know, care about the Clausewitz and all that stuff in the field. Um, in Gettysburg, I, every time I'm in Gettysburg, I always go by a couple of relic shops. I, I just can't help it. I just <laughs> like to look at relics. And um, I went by the um, uh, Union Drummer Boy over on, yeah. on Chambersburg Street. Yep. And um, uh, I went in there. And I saw a book in a behind a glass in a glass case, and I had him open the case and I looked at the book, because the, uh, the out the book read on the out on the on the on the cover, the outpost, mm -hmm. and that caught my eye. Mm -hmm. uh, Clausewitz uses the term outpost, right? And um, uh, for an advanced corps, this is what we're talking about: our advanced corps. He refers to him as outpost. I opened it up, and here was a copy of Dennis Hartmahan's text that he wrote in 1847 that had been published by a printer in New Orleans, Louisiana. And guess whose signature was on the frontispiece of that book? Who? James J. Archer, Brigadier General. Oh, my gosh. Now, you wow. tell me they don't pay attention to that stuff. Right. Uh it shows you hanging around relic shops can do wonders for you. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It, it yeah. tells you what you'd love to have, but can't. Archer was the femur with the bullet in it. Now it's <laughs> yeah, it was James Archer. Wow. wow. And he's a he's a brigadier general. He's a brigade commander. Yet he's got Dennis Hartman. He's a West Pointer. A yeah. Dennis Hartman's text with it. And he's coming down the chamber for his pipe. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Wow, that's that's amazing because that that whole idea, as we said offline, as you put in the book, of cutting their communication line. Right. Their communication line is the Chambersburg Road. It's the Chambersburg and, Pike. And and who's coming down it? But someone like James Archer, and and it just who's read the book? <laughs> carrying the book. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it was it, wow. it, 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 Meade actually instructed to Matt Reynolds to get on their road and route of communication. Uh -huh. And there's only one of those. Yeah, yeah. Only one. It's the Chambersburg yeah. Pike. That's why it begins out there. Yeah that that makes that makes total sense. What what was Reynolds is a very smart tactician he's 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 a professional consummate soldier he's a right. consummate soldier yet he he only takes one division with him yeah which is which is a big question i think it's going to haunt a lot of us for a while because he can't defend himself afterwards no. he's, he's killed no but it's almost like he thinks like i'm not going to meet a lot when i get there well it appears from the sources that that reynolds kind of felt that way uh, -huh. uh, 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 he says to the, the, the commander of the uh, artillery brigade of the first corps, um, that he doesn't expect anything to happen much up there, uh, -huh. uh because he was asked point blank, do you expect the enemy to confront us up there? And he says, no, I don't. But now does that excuse Reynolds not taking everybody with him? Remember Mahan, as well as Clausewitz and Jomini, will tell you that to move forward to operate as an advanced corps uh, under the theories of all three of those requires you to use everything you have. Uh, if you're a corps commander, you use the entire corps because uh -huh. what you've got to do is you've got to you've got to show a commanding presence. That forces the enemy then to react because they've got, if they look at you and you see you've, they've got, a, you've got a lot of troops, they're going to try to do something in response to that because right. it's a threat. If right. it's only one division, I don't know. But they, all those theorists say use everything you have. And because you're going to have to, at the very least, if they collect in front of you and then try to attack, you're going to have to engage in a fighting withdrawal and that means you got to use everything at your disposal field mm -hmm. artillery everything uh in order to hold them back while you continue a, a retrograde mm -hmm. so to go up there with only one of three divisions um invites 
a catastrophe. And mm -hmm. um, that's what happened. Mm -hmm. And obviously, Reynolds can't carry out the order fully because he's killed. He's killed. Yeah. Right, right after getting onto the field, that's which true. changes the whole course of this right. order. Right, right. You right. know, because he's the only one that has it. You found it in, a, in an envelope, I think, that was labeled <laughs> contents of John Reynolds' pockets. Again. Yeah. It, 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 it's, it back, it's like, wow, okay. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yeah, I did. And um, a, a whole lot of dispatches in there, uh, some of which did not make it into the official records, wow. including a dispatch from the uh, Signal Corps up on Carrick's Knob above Emmitsburg. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm that reported to John Reynolds early that morning of July 1 that they have not spotted any enemy formations in the valley where the fair, where Fairfield is. Uh, okay. Looking toward Fairfield, they spotted nothing. And all through the July 30, Reynolds kept notifying Meade he was fearful of a Confederate movement in that direction. Hmm. And... Um, uh, when the signal station up there reports to him that they've spotted nothing, he then felt free to move. Mm -hmm. And that thing, that little thing is written in pencil on onion skin paper. Oh, yeah. And it never made it in the official records, but all the rest of them did, including Meade's handwritten note to John Reynolds. But yeah. the fact that it was hand handwritten by him, it makes it, uh, uh, you know, incredibly personal. Oh, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. It, it means a lot to me then. He's oh, yeah. putting in his hand. Oh, and, yeah. Oh, and yeah. saying, this is oh, what yeah. I would like you to do. It's absolutely. not some staff officer. You know, no, no. No, no. No, it's me. It's me. Yeah. And he says thing, and he signs off, truly yours, George huh. G. Meade. This yeah. is on an order telling him what to do. He Truly yours? But it shows you how close they were. Right, right. How and much Reynolds, he regarded him. No. And Reynolds was just offered me the position Meade would be ordered to take and, right you know decline and, and decline. He declined it yeah yeah quite yeah. smartly probably but yeah. yeah his great quote in that was that i didn't want to take up uh, uh burnsides and hookers leavings <laughs> that was the reason he didn't want it yeah and of course Meade had no choice in the matter he had to take up their leavings yeah <laughs> yeah, yeah you're, you're ordered you're voluntold yeah. and, sorry sorry yeah. pal you're you're yeah. gonna do it <laughs> you're yeah. Yeah. yeah you're next yeah. on the list all right uh, that that idea when when you talk about that handwritten note to reynolds that you found uh in the archive and the the idea that had been around for a while that Meade kind of was not bumbling around, but he was kind of like just this hands off kind of person. He's not out there leading. He's kind of just figuring out what everyone else wants to do. I found that to be totally in left field, as they would say, like he's, he seems to be like right there when, when the action is happening. And we see that on the second day where he oh. is right there on the wheat field road and he isn't, he is directing traffic. He is, he is absolutely the tactical commander on the battlefield. Uh -huh. which the Army of the Potomac ne had never seen before and really would never see again, uh, uh -huh. quite like this. Uh, they'd never see Grant in that position. They would never, they never saw McClellan or any of the other commanders in that position. But here's George Meade, the tactical commander. He is literally on the Wheatfield Road right behind where the troops he's sending into combat. And it, it's it's a wonder it took him all day long before a bullet finally hit him and his horse. It huh. it shattered the pant leg of his, didn't penetrate his leg, but it then buried itself into the saddle and then the stomach of old Baldy. And um, but that was that was at the angle up there where Cushing's wow. battery was on the night of July second. And but it's a wonder that's the only place where a bullet actually nearly found its mark with him because he was so close to the fighting. And he was there at the angle at the end of the day. He was still right behind the troops he was commanding. Mm. Uh, uh, Thomas has a great question. If Meade is so active, then why does Hancock seem to get so much praise for, for Gettysburg <laughs> than Meade? You know, uh, uh, let me, you know, I mentioned this to you, John, before that I... After my my book, the Mead book came out, 
I got a lot of nice pe letters from people I don't know uh, <laughs> who wrote about it and so forth. And one came from a fellow in Canada who um, uh, was a collector, mostly of ephemera. And he sent this to me. Um, and this is a letter written by George Mead to John Batchelder, who, of course, is the c compiler of all the records of the Battle of Gettysburg and the first great historian of the Battle of Gettysburg. Mm -hmm. And it's written in Atlanta, Georgia. He's headquarters, headquarters of the 3rd Military District in um, 1868. And here is what Mead says in this letter to John Batchelder. And Batchelder apparently was asking him for what do you what records do you have showing you at various places on the battlefield? He says this: the vagaries of the battle did not permit my of my keeping in all cases copies of my orders, and the greater part of my orders were made verbally through staff officers. I find the same difficulty in all battles in which I commanded. Um, uh, viz. the impracticability of defining my exact position by a written record. It is this fact which causes, as you say, my name to appear so seldom in the elaborate communications that have been made to you by my subordinates, some of whom I'm well aware of do not desire to mention my name. Nevertheless, if you're the opinion that the truth of history requires my being ignored in this battle, I do not know any action on my part to remedy this evil. Mm. Now, here's a here's a general who, um, after the war, uh, is being asked about uh, what records you have showing you did this or that, and he says, um, "My subordinates are not seemingly not reporting I was anywhere." And he says, if you think this is the way history ought to be recorded, I have no way to remedy that evil. Hmm. So here you get Hancock, who, of course, runs for the presidency. He's um, he is a, a, a man who's who's has a meteoric rise in the public eye at the, at, after the war. And uh, maybe rightfully so. I don't know. I'm not going to be the judge of that. But in the process, George Meade is forgotten totally forgotten mm. by his subordinates. Mm -hmm. That's what he's saying. Like subordinates don't record anything. Mm. And um, I think it's a very sad commentary, particularly to, a, to, a, to a, an officer, a commander of an army that had been totally unsuccessful up until he took command. And he did so much to not only get it in position to win, but to fight the battle itself. And um, uh, there's not a record of anyone quite like that in the Civil War. And um, um, anyway, it's a, it's, a, it's a sad letter. And it, it shows you the difficulty the man was facing. Mm -hmm. And I think, I think some of it comes about because of what happened at the end of the campaign at, at, at the Downsville line near the Potomac River. Um, uh, and his interaction with Lincoln and things Lincoln said. And of course, by the time the war was over, Lincoln was a martyr. Right. And um, here's all the things he said about George Meade. And surely you're not going to oppose what Lincoln said. And uh -huh. um, uh, I, I was amused, John, uh, the, uh, one, of the, one of the most fun reviews I got on my book was from the uh, American Civil War Roundtable of the United Kingdom, hmm. and they uh, it's in London, right? And uh, there was an elaborate review of it. They really liked the book and all this stuff. And then they said, "But in the end, we've got to admit Lincoln takes kind of a knock." <laughs> Which he deserves, by the way. I mean, a very British review. <laughs> he takes kind of a knock. He's kind of a knock. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, the 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 one thing that I I I don't know if Coddington touched on this or not. And we were we were discussing Coddington before we went live yeah. about yeah. Uh, how it's. Coddington will be studied for years. Oh, yeah. I mean, he's a great writer. It's a great, it's, writer. It's, it's, it's a great book. 
Yeah, yeah great book. And it's, it's one of those that you have to have it in your library and, uh, uh, and admire it for, for when it was written and such. But Precisely. Um, Connington, I think, at points and some other uh, uh, authors uh, tend to make, especially when we talk about July 2nd, they tend to make Mead seem like he is constantly relying on his office, on his subordinates to be like, let's do this, let's do that because of the council of war or, you know, as, as Clausewitz would have called it, I think it was Clausewitz or was it Mahan called it a, a, a consultation. Uh, 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 that was Jomini. 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 Which, yeah, and, and, and Mead said that. And Mead, which means yeah. Mead was reading Jomini as well. <laughs> right. right. Mead called it a consultation. I couldn't remember yeah. if it was closets or not. Yeah. Uh, but he's literally doing something that uh, was taught to him. Right. And also something that George Washington did in the that's revolution. Right. And then to say that, well, that just shows that he's a weak leader, I think is oh, anti wow. what you're being taught anyway, because it's, it's part of oh. the team leadership, correct? Yeah. Where it's like, you're going to have, you're going to consult Everyone, plus you got to know what's going on the line, right? Right, Precise, precisely. No, I tell you what, there, anyone uh, 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 well, th who, who would say that the Council of War indicates that Meade had, you know, had, didn't have a grip, uh, just simply doesn't understand facts. <laughs> um, during the second day's fighting, uh, uh, brigades out of multiple corps, Sixth Corps, Fifth Corps, of course, the entire Fifth Corps was sent to the left. Uh, elements of the Sixth Corps were sent to the left. Uh, elements of the Eleventh Corps were sent to the left. Elements of the First Corps were sent to the center. Um, there, there were brigades from Corps all over the battlefield mm -hmm. by the end of that day. Mm -hmm. Now, don't you think it was it was justified for the commander of the army to get all his corps together to, so that the corps or corps commanders together so they could discuss where the hell all their units are? Right. I mean, at a minimum. Right. Um, and then to discuss uh, what we do next and then discuss, hey, how we get these people fed. By the way, uh, 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 General Williams brings up in a letter to his daughters that he discussed with all of his the corps commanders there that uh, hell, we don't know whether this army can survive. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't have any food. Mm -hmm. We don't have any fodder. We have nothing. And, and he said, I raise this with the rest of the commanders. What do we do about that? I mean, okay, we win a victory on the battlefield here today, but we might collapse tomorrow. Right. Because we can't get horses to pull guns. We can't do anything. We're paralyzed. No food. So do you think it's important for him to get all his core commanders together? Absolutely it is. Mm -hmm. I mean, he'd be, he'd be insane not to. Right. So, no, that uh, that council of war on the evening of July 2nd was absolutely essential for that army to get a grip on where it is uh -huh. and what it can do the next day, if anything. Uh -huh. um, so, no, I mean, there's there's just no doubt about it uh, for me to me. The no. the. Um... The third day, I've heard me get knocked for some of the actions on the third day, but it seemed to me that in the center of the line, most of it was over by the time, by the time know, he got by, there. By yeah. the time he got there, the yeah. attack lasts a little over a half hour, and and that's about it. And you know, but what what he what he contributed to the third day though was placing troops in a position where he believed they would be confronted by the bulk of the enemy's assaults. He knew the enemy was going to attack him. He always uh -huh. well, do. He believed the enemy was going to attack him. And he believed he was going to attack him in the center. And he he brought every, every brigade he could find into a position where they could resist that attack. And of course, that is exactly where the attack was launched and where it was, where it was, uh, 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 a lead was to the center of Meade's lines. And um, uh, Meade, unfortunately, was, was literally sh shelled out of the Leicester house to a barn across the Tannytown Road. That proved impracticable. In fact, General Butterfield was wounded in that barn. Uh, then he had to go all the way to the Baltimore Pike 
And by the time the attack had basically ended, Meade was on his way back to the center of the lines, uh, absolutely furious because he had been forced away from where the combat was. And um, one of the young artillerymen up at the up at the angle uh, made the comment that Meade was rather cross. And I thought to myself, wouldn't you be after all this? You've been forced out of this place from one headquarters to another to another, farther away from the 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 the, the impact of the enemy. And um, I'd be mad as hell. Right. And uh, would you expect him to just have this equanimity about him when he comes up there and he's happy about it? No, he's not happy about it. He's mad. Yeah. So. Yeah. And then they fault Meade because he didn't launch a counterattack. Right. And, um, of course, to launch a counterattack, you first of all got to make sure you understand what you're attacking. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, he went all the way to Little Round Top, went up there to the site of the position of the 146th uh, uh, New York Infantry up there. And from there, he looked out and he could see that the enemy had is, was occupying uh, the Devil's Den, that the, the 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 ridge there, and they had begun uh, forming along the Emmitsburg Road behind it. Hmm. And do you attack across those fields? Hmm. What what is going to happen to your left flank as you move across those fields to try to counterattack against uh, what's left of Pickett's division? Mm -hmm. um, you could face a ferocious assault. But even more important was the lateness of the day and the fact that it started to rain. Mm -hmm. And um, Meade wanted no part of that. And wisely so. Mm -hmm. So I, you know, the idea of a counterattack um, to me is a non-starter mm -hmm. um, for multiple reasons. Right. And it, and it really underscores what we talked about earlier where their supply line, it, they're uh, not able to get anything through. They still uh, haven't been fed. Nobody's been right. fed. Not a horse has been fed. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, and this has been for days now. Right. And um, and remember, you know, he orders 51,000 pair of shoes between June 28 and July 1. We're now on July 3rd, and they still haven't gotten anything. So how mm -hmm. many how many of his troops are shoeless now? Wow. Yeah. I mean, think of it. Yeah. Um, one half of them were without shoes when the battle began. Uh, here we are. It, and it, well, it, it's it, what it, it, it's almost um, something you you you, you want to block out of your head because you think, well, he's in Pennsylvania. He's you know right in his home state. Surely to God, these guys are well fed. They've got everything going for them. But the fact is, they don't. Well, Lee's army had been there and picked a lot of it clean. Well, yeah, and you know, as I've as I, I say in the book, um, and I this comes really out of my work on the retreat, uh -huh. is that when Lee's army came comes on the field, it comes on deliberately. It won the first day's battle clearly, demolished the first and eleventh corps. It won the first day's battle, and as elements of that army come on the field, they establish division hospitals at houses around behind three miles behind where they believe the fighting would begin for them. This is true of all of Lee's core, the divisions of all Lee, of Lee's three corps. Mm -hmm. And around those hospitals, they establish quartermaster parks where all their quartermaster trains are brought. And all of their commissaries of subsistence have all of their trains and their beef and sheep on the hoof and even hogs on the hoof. So all that is brought to those hospitals three miles behind the battle lines in every corps in Lee's army. So when the fighting ends on each day of the second and the third, those, those, those troops have food. It may be meager, but uh -huh. they have food. Uh -huh. Their animals have hay and oats and fodder. So because of just the way in which Lee was able to set his army up, having the time to do so, because he won the first day. Meade, on the other hand, is pushing everybody forward. Uh -huh. He has no time to consider anything else other than to get the troops there. 
And to do so, he has to leave his base of supply. And unfortunately, it's tied to his troops in Gettysburg by the Baltimore pipe. Mm -hmm. See, he has an entirely different problem. And with Lee's army, they were fed enough horses, mules, and men to where when they began a withdrawal, they were in better, I put that in somewhat quotes, better shape than its enemy. Right. It's almost like the uh, the Army of the Potomac had home field advantage just in the field only. It, was, field. it wasn't supplies. It wasn't no, they nothing. Were, they were Maybe psychological. Time. Maybe kind of a psychological. Yeah, right. oh, we're, this is our home country. Yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 That that's what's really uh, amazing to me is that you know you're you're actually further away from your supplies than your enemy is because they've yeah. been there a while and they've picked it clean. Yeah. I have the records from my family who lost two horses to the Army of Northern Virginia when they came through and all their subsistence is gone and everything else. Yeah, that's gone before Meade's army ever gets in the area. So that's what's yeah. in the bellies. That's what's in the bellies of these Confederates as they're going back to the Potomac River. Right. That's, right. They they had it. They had right. some. Right. And Meade just does not. Right. Yeah. For everyone who has uh, stuck around with us, thank you so much. I want to put up the UNC discount code because UNC Press is kind enough to give all of us a 40% discount on Kent's book. And I'll put the link in the chat one more time. You can get me to Gettysburg, if I can turn it properly, uh, <laughs> command. Uh, and his previous book on the retreat from Gettysburg, both of them you can get 40% off with that code that I'm flashing down below. And I will put the... Uh, the uh, link in the chat one more time for that. Kent, I want to ask you, uh, as we wrap up here in a few minutes, about this idea of the uh, pursuit and then going towards Waynesport. Uh, Meade has another, he consults the Corps commanders again on July 4th at this right. rickety right. shack, basically, <laughs> near Rock <laughs> Creek, to decide what the next move is. But has he already made up his mind what the next move is? He already thought about it, and he's just going back to consult and see where everybody's sitting? On he had this? already made up his mind. In fact, he had written two letters, one to General Darius Couch, commander of the Department of the Susquehanna, and, command, and, and to General Baldy Smith. And he told both of them, that he would pursue Lee by way of Emmitsburg and Middletown, mm -hmm. which means he's going on the east side of the South Mountain Range and the Catoctin Mountains, all the way to Middletown, which is on the, the, the uh, 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 National Road from, right. from Frederick to uh, the uh, uh, Turner Pass, it's just, just east of Turner Pass. And he's going to go from Emmitsburg to Middletown and then across the South Mountain Range to confront Lee. Oh. He'd already said it. Hmm. He wrote it the day before the conference. But this is typical of George Meade, though. Remember, on July 2nd, he did the same thing. He wrote a letter at 8 o'clock that night telling Henry Halleck he is going to stay there. He's not going to move. And it wasn't sent down the Baltimore Pike until after 11 o'clock because of the attacks. Mm -hmm. So what Meade, way Meade operates is that he'll make up his own mind about what he wants to do. But he will then, without telling his subordinates, he'll ask them, what do you want to do? And see what they say. And mm -hmm. it's interesting in both circumstances, they agreed with him without knowing that he'd already come to that decision, <laughs> which, which uh, there's an interesting aspect to his idea of command here. Uh, he wants them, he wants those guys themselves to come up to, with the right decision. Mm. Because if they do, it means they're all in emotionally. Right. They're all in. This is our idea. Right. Uh, he doesn't want to say, I'm going to do this, get going. Uh, right. He wants them to say they're all in. He's a team player. Mm -hmm. He's the type the army today would love. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, the yeah. one who is the star on the football team and he knows how to play on a team sport and he's everything's a team game. Meade mm -hmm. is one of those types. I think that could be, uh, I might be reaching Kent, but I think that could be where he seemingly to some historians and other other people, some armchair generals, 
seems to pass the buck when in actuality, mm -hmm. the primary sources that he writes under it just obliterates that where it's saying yes. he wrote this an hour before the consultation. He did. He this. And, yeah. and it's like, he's already made his mind up. He's staying. And I think we, we did a, we did a video in Meade's headquarters uh, last July for the national park service. And I think Pete Carmichael asked the, the little group we had there, each of us mm -hmm. uh, is basically has made, made up his mind what he's doing there and i immediately said yeah he's made up his mind what he's doing he's Correct. not going anywhere he's staying saying right there and, and right and there. On, on the july 2nd one right and then, right. And then what you see on the fourth is kind of like what we always heard grant get so much praise for which he rightfully should mm -hmm. which was moved by the left flank mm -hmm. and it was the same thing Meade wants to do yeah. and does do yeah. uh, in july of 63 but it's right. just when they get to williamsport that's where it's kind of like Meade's consult uh, really mm -hmm. comes in handy because I think he doesn't really know, or maybe he doesn't see what's going on, uh, but the Corps commanders do out there what, at Williamsport. The, yeah, at how, Williamsport. How, how much right. Lee is entrenched? Well, you also got to remember between Frederick and Meade's position outside of the Downsville line, across from the Downsville line. He had been in consultation with Halleck and Lincoln. He had gotten word that Lincoln, you know, wants him to, quote, destroy the enemy. Then the war will be over. Praising Grant at Vicksburg, which is justifiable, of course. But then and now if Meade can in literally or substantially destroy the enemy, Lee, then um, the war will be over. So now the bar is now way up here. For, for me, how do you destroy an enemy as sophisticated and as large as the army of Northern Virginia? You don't. You can defeat it. You can't destroy it. But this is where the bar has been taken. Then all the way from Frederick to the Downsville line, Meade is bombarded with Halleck, constantly telling him that he's got to move by forced marches. And he says, look at We've had troops that have moved more than 30 miles last night alone, and none of them have any shoes, and they're losing their horses. There's no horses left. And we're doing everything we can do. He's been bombarded with this. Mm -hmm. Now, when he gets down in front of that Downsville line and he sees it, it's an imposing position that Lee's taken. He, his first impulse is, I've got to attack somehow because of all the traffic I've been getting from Washington. I've got to attack. Right. And so he tells Halleck, uh, in the morning, I'll, I'll attack. And then, you know, he tells his subordinates this, and he, he hears them say, you know, let's, let's all talk about it. Let's talk about it. <laughs> yeah. And he agrees to talk about it. But you can see why the, the, the I mean, they almost led Meade into ordering what would have been a slaughter of that army mm. in front of that Downsville line. It's just way too imposing and too masterfully engineered. And uh, Meade almost went for it uh, until he mentioned it to his subordinates and got a rather dismal response right. and then calls a conference, a council of war uh, to his credit, to his credit. And um, it uh, probably saved a lot of useless losses, frankly. Mm -hmm. And it yeah. would have been disastrous for morale. Disastrous. And, and then think, the entire Gettysburg campaign would have been turned on its head. Right. This was not a victory for you. Right. And so uh, what do you want? Yeah. What do you want? Yeah. You know? And, and yeah. frankly, as, as, Henry, as, as Henry Hunt wrote after the war, um, because of the victory Meade brought them, the first victory of the Army of the Potomac in the war, 26 months. Because of the victory he brought them, uh, Lincoln got this unrealistic idea of what could now happen. Mm. And it's that lack of, 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 of realism that uh, prompted Lincoln and the War Department to prod Meade uh, by force marches, everything else to get there, and then to try to attack 
and when he decided he that they would not attack after the Council of War, Halleck blew up, and Meade and and and, and Lincoln claimed that a golden opportunity had been lost, had been frizzled, frizzled away, and um, all this when in fact he probably saved uh, a, a useless slaughter out there. To be mm. So, Kent, in the last twenty years or so, since since you brought out the book on the on the the logistics of the retreat, and yeah. you brought out this book, uh, how have how have uh, you your thoughts on me changed, if at all, from from these two books? Have have they have they been reinforced? Have you done a one hundred and eighty on Mead? Have you been surprised? Uh, I, I you know all I knew about Mead was what I read about Mead before I wrote sure. these. And, sure. um, and, and that was, that was not altogether negative. It's just that you ran into a lot of negative stuff, particularly toward the end of this campaign. Mm -hmm. And, um, it's really what prompted me writing the retreat book to do a book on George Mead. The press asked me, what do you want to do next? And I said, well, I'm going to do George Mead. And, and the reason I wanted to do George Mead was that I kind of admired him writing the retreat book. I thought, wait a minute, this is not the guy that, you know, is being portrayed so much. And so obviously my impression of George Meade has risen immensely. I, I, uh, I am a, a great admirer of him as a result of this, not because I felt that before. It's, I was, uh, I had made no mind up other than having seen what he did during the retreat from Gettysburg, what he did then, uh, to confront Lee, I thought I need someone needs to do a work on him. And what I, I, I said this to someone else earlier today, um, that um, the book is filled with original sources, of course. But I would say seventy-five to eighty percent of it is from the official records, and these are not the after-action reports. I consulted none of them. What I did consult are all the dispatches of Meads and his subordinates to him, Meade to the president, Meade to Halleck, Meade to all his subordinates. Uh, those are the issues, those are the matters that are important. I, I was a trial lawyer for 46 years, 47 years. And you know, the document you've got in your hand that was written contemporaneously with the event is the one you want. That's the one you could tell a jury you rely on the most uh -huh. uh, in a court. And so to go into the dispatches that are the orders he's issuing at the time of the event or receiving at the time of the event are the key. And no one had ever bothered to do that. Huh. No one had ever read them, it seems, or ever cited them much. Uh -huh. And, you know, you get a you get a fellow like Alan Gelzo, who is a good friend. I like Alan a lot. But he puts in his book that John Reynolds went to Gettysburg on his own in order to keep the battle from being fought in Maryland, rather have it in Pennsylvania. Well, now, where does he find that in the official records? I have no idea. <laughs> uh, but it was kind of the stuff that, you know, you're running into. Uh -huh. And if he'd only looked, he'd see that George, it was George Meade on July 30th who ordered me ordered Reynolds to Gettysburg. Uh-huh. Right. And then he ordered each of the other corps commanders to the mechanics, uh, to uh, to Manchester, to uh, two taverns, and on and on, Hanover. He ordered them, right. and um, it's like they intentionally try to take it out of Meade's hands. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but the documents say otherwise. The documents oh. say otherwise. So I rest my case. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, you won't get any argument from me. That's, that's Kent's closing argument right there. It sounds my closing argument. The documents, that's right. the documents speak for themselves. The documents speak Always for themselves. Always go to dispatches. That's, that's right. I mean, that's, that, right. that's actually right, though. That it's a great point. That's their thought in the moment. That's right. It's not after five days, I'm going to write a report, and I'm going to leave a couple right. things out, or I'm going to blunt, you know. It's, 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 the, it's the rule of best evidence. What's the best evidence? It's what's written at the very time of the event. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And this is even more important. Because these are not only written at the time of the event. They were the ones directing the traffic. Right. Yeah. Those orders. Yeah. So that little piece of onion skin that you find in the archives could change. An yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. And that's the beauty of 
history in general. You could find that one document in an envelope <laughs> that hasn't been uncovered in, ever or in 50 years. And it's just like, here you go. This is, yeah, yeah, that's, yeah. That's, that's, that's why I really enjoyed this book was the fact that I heard so many people say, uh, we've written everything on Gettysburg. We've written everything on it. It's there's nothing more you can do. And it's like, well, wait a minute. You can un you can find a file folder that hasn't been uncovered, right? That has, like you say, dispatches in it or something else, and it right. changes your entire thought process on a particular person or a moment. Yeah, and that's I'll the tell you, finding that envelope with that letter from George Meade to Reynolds, and oh. finding that in in that envelope that dispatch from the signal station. Uh, among many others in there, uh, just was a mind blower for me. I mean, I I just I saw and it and there and it was in the eleventh core papers, which is kind of interesting. You go, why the eleventh core papers? Yeah. Well, Howard became the senior commander on the battlefield, and so uh, wh where do they do when they take this out of Reynolds' pockets? They give it to the senior commander because he needs to know what Reynolds knew. Yeah. So sense. it wound up in the eleventh Corps papers, and um, but it has on the front of that envelope contents taken from the pockets of Major General John F. Reynolds, July one, eighteen sixty-three. <laughs> that just kind of yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you just got to step away from the table, ah, so and, yeah. Ah, take a ah. breather. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, everyone in the chat, I put the discount code into the chat. And I put a link to uh, me to Gettysburg Study and Command in the chat as well. It'll direct you also to Kent's author page on UNC Press. So you can pick up his other book on the retreat from Gettysburg if you so desire. But you'll get 40% off of both of those books when you add it to your cart with that discount code. And Kent, I want to thank you so much for your time this evening and for uh, pushing us to understand the man behind the Army of the Potomac uh, starting the latter part of June 1863 and through the entire war after that. It's nice to see uh, him get some praise and some just uh, some justice uh, yeah. after after so long. And, and I really appreciate your time. And as I said off the air before we went live, uh, we got to do something about John Buford now. <laughs> Yes. That's another story. All yeah, yeah. I said, we, we were discussing that offline, everybody, and I, I thought you would appreciate this. We we were discussing him being on the Chambersburg Pike because we talked about sending Reynolds to the Chambersburg Pike, and there's John Buford. And I said the title of the book should be "What the Hell Is Buford Doing Here?" <laughs> as, the next, as the next one, because he's just there. So yeah, <laughs> and I'll come up with a more professional. That's my title, but. Kind of, uh, <laughs> But thank you again, Ken, for your for your expertise and for and for uh, being on here. It's been an absolute joy to have you on. Well, it's been a joy for me to be with you, John. It's just terrific. You're great. You're well, great. You. Let's do it some more. Let's do another one. Let's do yeah. another one. <laughs> thank you, everyone, for watching. I appreciate you uh, hanging out with us in in chat, and uh, we hope that you uh, go to UNC Press, buy the book, use that discount code because it's cheaper than Amazon. And, you know, get that discount code in there. I hope you have a wonderful evening. Please stay safe, uh, stay healthy, and we will chat with you very soon. Take care, everybody. Bye, folks.